Hello, audience. My name is Tony Carnes for the, the, for the television program of Journey Through NYC Religion. In the 1970s and 80s, New York City was in a mess. It was a wreck. However, there was a rivulet of faith uh, going out through the city. Young kids in the Bronx, uh, who were graffiti artists, uh, drew on their catechisms in church to add religious elements into the graffiti, particularly in graffiti that said, we need to stop the madness that's going on in the streets. Here's a famous one by Swerve and uh, Pers uh, Nomad and FX, three graffiti groups. And in this uh, piece of graffiti, they say, drugs is like crucifying Christ. It was a, it's a remarkable uh, show in a, a desperate city that even the kids knew there had to be something more, something better, that would have a religious tone to it. In 1990, a pastor who grew up in rural uh, Texas uh, started a magazine called First Things. He also later became a Catholic priest. And today we have the uh, current editor of First Things, uh, Rusty Reno. Uh, Rusty, welcome to uh, Journey Through NYC Religion. It's great to be with you, Tony. You know, um, the, um, when the First Things first started, it was sort of a coalition of uh, faith groups. It was to be a forum for Catholics and uh, uh, evangelicals and uh, uh, Orthodox Jews and others to uh, discuss about how to overcome the problems from a uh, Christian perspective or a religious perspective right. um, that were happening to the nation and into the city. Yeah, they, I mean, or Newhouse, when he founded it, his big concern. Richard J. Newhouse. Richard John Newhouse. His big concern was that religious voices were being pushed to the margins of public discussion about the future of the country. and. Our mission has really remained the same, which is to provide a, a forum for religiously motivated people to speak about public issues. And he called that the Naked Public Square. Yeah, Naked Public Square is stripped of religious content. So you are providing some clothing. We're clothing it with, uh, with the good words of, uh, of religious faith. Yeah, it's not just Christian, although it's, I think it's fair to say that we're, we're heavily Christian. We have a strong Jewish um, uh, set of writers and as you pointed out, Orthodox, Evangelical Christians, yes. Now, you didn't r grow up here in New York, did you? No, I was born and raised in Baltimore, Maryland. Baltimore, Maryland? No, Baltimore, Maryland. Baltimore, yes. Baltimore, Maryland. You gotta, yes. you gotta mumble it if you wanna be a true Baltimorean. <laughs> okay, good to know. A little native uh, language yeah. there. Yep. Uh, and where did you go to college? I went to Haverford College. It's a small liberal arts college outside of Philadelphia. And you went on to, as, as I understand, to graduate school? And yeah, I lived here study? in New York in the early 80s, kind of get my act together, figuring out what I wanted to do with life, and decided to do a PhD in theology, and went, wound up going to Yale University to do the PhD. So when we, you were here in the 80s, what part of the city did you live in? Uh, I lived at 123rd in Amsterdam. Oh. Kind of a little on the, on the edges of the tough area because that was where it was cheaper. <laughs> <laughs> so you got, you got a pretty good taste of what New York was coming out of. Oh, no doubt about it. It was, uh, it was, a, rough, uh, it was a rough city, as, as you said in your intro. Very, very hard times. So you didn't grow up uh, rabble-rousing, uh, a rose... Uh, rosary swinging Catholic, did you? No, I was raised an Episcopalian, pious uh, parents, I'd say, but Episcopalianism is, uh, it's a low blood pressure form of Christianity, not a high blood pressure kind of Christianity. Well, how did, how did you change? Well, I read, when I was a grad student, John Henry Newman, who's going to be canonized uh, tomorrow, uh, oh, John Henry Newman's a, a, a towering figure uh, in English Catholicism. Right, but he started out as an Anglican, and Episcopalian in the United States is, the Angl is a form of Anglicanism. And it was through Newman that I really, I really was impressed by what I would call the objectivity of grace, that God, that God acts upon our lives through the instrumentalities of the church, the sacraments, baptism, Eucharist, and so forth. And that just led me on a journey that eventually I wound up in the Catholic Church in 2004. Now, Newman himself was not so much a 
a theologian of writing systematic theology. He was more of a theologian of action. Well, uh, yes, I, 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 my image is that he was like a taxi cab. He only came when he was called. <laughs> and so he tended to write. To problems, to pr he, he tended to write to solve problems. Some of them were his own. Um, in his own migration into the Catholic Church, he had to, he wrote a very famous book on the development of doctrine. And that book was clearly meant to, to address his own anxieties of conscience about whether he could really believe that the teachings of the Catholic Church were organically grew out of the original gospel message of the first century. You know, I, I can't, uh, shouldn't let this moment pass is that, do you have a, a, Hen, a John Henry Newman book that you would recommend people to read if they are trying to explore faith and uh, yeah, we, one, of the, of one of the one of the Newman he gave sermons at Oxford University back in his Anglican days, and they're beautiful sermons on the th question of faith and reason. And a lot of my friends, we all at various point in our lives uh, often have a certain concern about science and religion and faith and reason. And uh, those sermons, which are are luminous, uh, I would strongly recommend to our listeners to and viewers to to take a look at those sermons. Now, as you they're called the, uh, they're called un the University Sermons or Newman's University Sermons. Now, we, you mentioned that um, Newman would write uh, not so much theological tomes, but theology addressed pressing problems, yes. almost pastoral problems. Right. And uh, could we say that's sort of what your book does? Well, I, I try, I think uh, one of my friends told me that I was never really a scholar, and I, I take that to be a, something of a compliment. <laughs> but yes, Return of the Strong Gods is an attempt to explain the spiritual horizon, as I would, I would describe it, the spiritual horizon of the age of Trump, if I want to put it in the, most, in the sharpest terms. Well, who are these, um, these strong gods? Well, a strong God is anything that arouses in us uh, love and loyalty. Like here, I think it says patriotism. And yes, patriotismo. Uh, patriotism is an obvious strong God, but um, the marital bond is a strong God. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, um, our religious commitments are a strong God. And so, um, for, for truth is a strong God. If you think about it, Truth is a strong word, whereas meaning, meaning is a kind of, it's a more open-ended word. Very Not, soft. It's a softer word, it's a weaker word. And the thesis of the book is that uh, because of the catastrophes of World War II, atomic bombs, Auschwitz, the horrors of, of, uh, that were done, a consensus emerged that we need to weaken people's loves so that they're not so ardent and they're not so destructive. In fact, you say that uh, America is living on the destiny of weakening. Yes. Well, What do you mean by that? Well, so you start out, we want to have an open society, we want to have open minds, um, open trade, open borders. And so the prestige of the word openness, which really is already in the 50s and certainly really bursts into um, onto the scene in the 60s, the prestige of openness uh, now is, is, is really all-powerful. So a kind of paradoxical thing. It's a, the strong God is the, st of the God of weakening, so to speak, or the, the God that opens things up, makes things fluid, porous. Liquid, uh, you call it. More liquid so that it doesn't, it doesn't consolidate and become authoritarian or domineering. So that it, it just flows around. If you oppose it, it just flows around you and doesn't s force you to go in any particular. Well, no you have obligatory liquid uh, liquidity, so to speak. Uh, so you have to float with it. You have to float with it exactly. And so the idea of non-judgmentalism—that you're not supposed to ju be be judgmental towards others, and everybody should be able to live as they wish. This is obligatory, but it's a paradoxical obligation. It's not a healthy decision. It's not a. This is not a helpful choice you tell your child, so as this opposed the, to right and wrong. So weakening is sort of the, the tricky strong God. It's a very, it's a trickster. It, it's a trickster, but it's very much dominant in our age. And the book argues that 
in order to pursue this openness, we have ha pursued a project over the last three generations of what I would call cultural deregulation, and then uh, after the 1980s, economic deregulation. And so by the time we get to our time, populism emerges because voters are saying, whoa, I don't want to live and swim, tread water endlessly in this liquid, w liquid world. I want some place I can take a, I can, something solid in which I can stand. So something that's, what, how should I put it, economically secure foundation. I think we see this in a lot of political debates about the fate of the American working class. But also, people want family, marriage. They want a stable cultural environment, stronger norms. I want to come back to this. I just want to uh, uh, let our audience know that this book is not out yet. Uh, next week. Next week, yep. October, October 15th. October 15th is the launch date, yes. And will you have some sort of launch uh, party or something? We're going to do it at our office at First Things, and we're in Midtown Manhattan on, I think it's November 4th. But people can go online and look at firstthings.com, okay. and we'll have an announcement of that event. Uh, the I, I, I urge viewers to come. It, it'll be a festive occasion. Yes, I'll, uh, I'll offer some remarks, and uh, I they can buy a book. A lot of things we're going to touch about today, we're just going to touch about. But if you want to really uh, get it from the source, uh, you know, come, come then, and uh, it'd be... Uh, and if you hear, hear something that you want to challenge, you can come and uh, talk to we, us we about are, it. We are, we are all about, not dialogue, that's a soft, weak word, <laughs> but debate, that's a strong word. So, <laughs> so in this debate, you say that, uh, so in this debate, you say that, well, we've come to a liquid moment and, uh, uh, and people are looking for something solid. One thing is that the people are reacting against is the elitism that's grown up. Yeah, we live in a kind of paradoxical time, as I was saying. Uh, Charles Murray's book, Coming Apart, made a big impact me on me. That was published in 2012. Mm -hmm. And he tells a story about how people at the top of society, the top 20%, they have a kind of, the, the economic system works for them, global economic system works for them, and they've also got kind of a bourgeois life. They, they get married, they stay married, and, um, but it's funny, they walk the walk of the 50s, but they talk the talk of the 1960s, which is uh, the, this deregulatory talk. This the two the rhetoric, deregulations. The, the deregulation of culture. Even though they've re-regulated their, their own enclaves. Hmm. And so uh, I think this is a serious problem in our society is that the quality of life for the top 20% is now, um, um, it's good. It's a good time to be well-to-do in America. And, but everybody else seems to be having harder and harder times. So we have declining life expectancy. And the decline of life expectancy is being driven by really catastrophic declines in white working class Americans. We're talking four to five years for, of a decline over the past decade for men and a three year decline for so women. So it's killing them early. It is killing them early. And their deaths are drug overdose, alcohol related, uh, adult onset diabetes, uh, suicide. So, so there's so-called deaths of despair. Let me see if I got this right. We had a, sort of the weakening God comes in after World War II, uh, say we don't ever want to go back to these horrors, so let's just not emphasize anything so absolute. Don't give people strong things to unify around. And that, I think, the effect of it has been to demoralize all of us, really, because we're all spiritual beings. We seek to honor and serve something greater than ourselves. And if you don't give people healthy loves to unite around, they're going to adopt, they're either going to become, I think, spiritually disoriented or they'll adopt perverse loves. But out of this, this movement of weakening, how does the rise of the dominance of the new elite come about? Well, I mean, uh, I guess I can be a little bit, a little cynical here that a demoralized general population is much less likely to hold our leadership class accountable. Mm -hmm. And one of the, one of the uh, people at the top are always ambivalent about democracy because 
And so we, we tend now Plus to it's, have... It's, they're, 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 they're on top, so th that doesn't necessarily favor them. It, correct. And so I think we see in our society a, a move towards a kind of technocratic attitude. We should let experts kind of run things. Well, it is, by the way, we had Vatican II. Was that a weakening? Oh, uh, I think so. And did it favor elitism? Uh, um, Mary Douglas wrote a very beautiful she, anthropologist. The anthropologist, uh, her sort of critique of the 1960s in a book called Natural Symbols. Mm -hmm. And in the introduction to that book, she really focuses on Vatican II and the removal of the Friday fast from meat and that it was a class war. So elite people, they want a kind of highly verbalized, you know, explain, uh, surrounded, a way of life surrounded by explanations versus yeah. working class people who are, rely much more on kind of clear boundaries. And by removing the boundaries, her argument was that it actually undermined working class Catholic culture in England, which is mostly Irish uh, who had immigrated for economic reasons. And it favored um, university educated Catholics. Now, out of this, so she saw that very early on. Yeah, that's a yeah, that's a remarkable picture. Yeah, Robert Bella was the one who's a great sociologist of religion. He and I corresponded about these issues, and he's the one that put me on to reading Douglas. He said, because he agreed. He, um, so, if, and I think if we look at our moral culture, somebody says, "Well, you know, we want we want marriage to be, you know, if you get rid of clear roles for." men and women, then everything's a negotiation. And if everything's a negotiation, it favors people with excellent verbal skills. So out of this... Uh, and if you don't have good verbal skills, you're not going to do well at a pattern of life dependent on constant negotiation. So it favors people with verbal skills, particularly those educated in universities? Correct. And So we're in a perverse situation, Tony, now in 2019, where we have a moral culture that tends to privilege people who have these excellent verbal skills. And we have an economic system that tends to privilege people who have high IQ and, ex and excellent education. And, it, and that's, I think, part of the populist anger is the feeling that what it means to be a good person and how to be economically successful is all fusing together and it's become increasingly the sole province of the top 20%. Now you say that this populism that has arisen uh, also contains desires for strong gods. Yes, people want to unify around shared loves. I, 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 what proof do you have of that? And you say that it, it may mean that they want to unify around uh, uh, faith at some point. What proof do you have Well, of that? patriotism, I think, is the obvious one. That's the cover from yes. the book. Um, so if you, look at, if you look at classic Republican politics, you know, since Reagan, I mean, uh, Ted Cruz in the convention speech must have used the word freedom a hundred times. It was <laughs> Ronald Reagan on steroids. And Trump's convention speech in 2016, the Re Republican National Convention, was, did not use the word freedom at all. And that, to me, I really like, whoa, wow. wow. I didn't realize that. What he said, I will protect you. So as opposed to, I will liberate you. So what's the meaning of Trump and, th and, and I might add, the impeachment age that we're in? What is that? Oh, gosh, you know, it's so, it's so complicated. But I think if you look at Trump's signature issues that got him the nomination, you know, the general election is always more complicated. It was wall. That's a, that's a solid, that's a strong, strengthening. That's motif. a Mary Douglas idea. Yeah, you build a wall. By the way, uh, uh, viewers might want to know that Mary Douglas, in her little book, Purity and Danger, does an incredible analysis of the book of Leviticus and all the categories and separations there. Yes. So she takes this idea that grids are actually necessary to understand and ha live life, and that when you fuzz up the grids... People get disoriented. You get disoriented. So uh, Trump, in some ways, I'm trying to bring yes. us to... A wall is part of a grid, part of a... No, I said you, you, have, you have a border, you have a boundary. And what is, and the boundary and the grid, what does it define? It defines who the leadership class of America is responsible to. 
They're responsible to the people inside the border, that's to say their fellow Americans. They're not responsible to the world. And Trump says this over and over again. Yeah, it's right. my job to promote the interests of America, not the interests of the whole world. Um, so he ran on that, built a wall. He also ran on trade. We just, he just, I guess they just uh, got preliminary settlement for this trade battle. But if you look at the, I'm going to tear, China, I'm yeah. going to tear up the trade deals. He says, yeah. "What is that?" He's saying, "I will protect you, the worker." And then, of course, this whole language, "Make America Great Again," it's all language of reconsolidation. Now, if you go back to after the end of the Cold War, in 1980. George H.W. Bush gave a speech at the United Nations. I talk about this in the book. And he, in v he at one point, kind of key moment of the speech, he says, you know, we, now we can look towards a new future of open trade, open borders, and open minds. And I think that what's happened here is that those are, in some contexts, those are all good things. but. They've become the sole and exclusive emphasis of our dominant political cultural consensus. Those Ever three things are one. Op open borders, open trade, and open minds. The particular themes is not right, but it's just the prestige of the word openness mm -hmm. and open is really something. So diversity, inclusion, these are variations on the theme of openness. And, um, you know, uh, one problem with it is that it, it it pushed to an extreme it makes everybody homeless and you know because in order to exercise hospitality you have to have a home to invite people into and in order to have a home you actually have to have it has to have walls and so I think a lot of voters feel as though they are increasingly homeless you so know you look but yes. no Tony if you look at the uh, how how much uh, uh, the polarization in our politics very intense, but what really strikes me is that everybody feels as though they're under assault. Yes, that's right. Everybody. They believe really we're in apocalyptic times. But you know, so it's so my my, uh, I was talking to one of my liberal friends in the university, and and my view is, God, you know, you own the university. Why would you feel so threatened? And uh, we had a long conversation, and it's clear that he felt very vulnerable. And then, obviously, a lot of these populist voters that vote for Trump or in Europe also feel vulnerable. Vulnerable to what? Well, that's an interesting question. Why? Are, so we've created. That's why I see this motif of openness is always a walls exclude, but they also protect. And so, as we tear down all of these walls, we 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 all we see is the positive. We we are we're sold all the positive benefits of that, and there are there are many positive benefits. But we've discounted that feeling of homelessness that comes from t taking down all of the boundaries. You know, I you can sort of piece together from various trends about how um, how this how this works out and why uh, people uh, in the university might feel uh, scared. Uh, Milton Rokic wrote a, a book, a social psychologist wrote a book called The Open and Closed Mind. Right. And he uh, observed professors of who they judged had open and closed minds. And what he found out was is that the professors were bad judges. <laughs> they, they judged people that disagreed with them who were conservatives as those with the most closed-mindedness. It's a standard trope after World War II. But when Rokic tested the class, it was actually the students that agreed with Professor that were most closed because they only parroted back what the liberal professor said. Yeah, see, I've just, I've, I, I think the open-closed dichotomy is just not very useful because, look, your mind closes on truth, right? So you're not sure. You go to university and you have some good professors, and they really convince you. Yes. Uh, you know, of I don't know. You could become a convinced Marxist, or you could become a convinced Christian, or you could yeah. become a convinced liberal. But when when you're convinced, you you close upon that that truth, and uh, and that's not a bad thing because that's what gives you the 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 stick to itness. That's what gives you the capacity to actually 
fight for what you think is right. Because if we're open, purely open, we, you know, it, it's the old country song, you gotta stand for something or you'll fall for anything. But what happens if you are so closed that you become sort of a devotee of, of some fierce idol, that's a like nationalism? Exactly, that's, that's why the consensus in favor of openness was initially uh, developed, is because 1914 to 1945, this terrible, millions and millions of people destroyed, exactly as you said, from this kind of fanatical devotion to ideology. But I think now, in 2019, the problems we suffer from are not, you know, the problems of an overly consolidated, fanatical society. Instead, again, it's this problem of vulnerability. It's everywhere. People really feel homeless. You know, and so, so I think every age has a different, we're now suffering from a disease caused by the cure for an other for a disease of, of the past. It yeah. happens all the time in human history. Well, you know, it's a very old cure. Uh, the philosophs back in, uh, you know, the 16th, 17th century in France invented the word ideology because they said, oh, the, at the French Revolution, they wanted to kill us. They, yes. it, it got so out of control that they wanted to kill the people that said we were for the French Revolution. So they invented the word ideology so they could analyze why people's mind becomes closed and so rigid and so destructive. Right. I mean, see, for me, the opposite of, of the open mind is not the closed mind, but the loving mind. I hear that uh, you were in uh, Oxford this summer. Is that right? Yes, sir. I was at a conference, yes. And did you take a moment to revisit uh, one of uh, John Henry Newman's sites? Yes, I went to St. Mary's Church, where he was the university preacher during his Anglican years. Well, in light of this uh, book, uh, Return of the uh, Strong Gods, which looks very warlike here, <laughs> were you revisiting, uh, this was St. Mary's that you revisited? Yes. Were you revisiting to gird yourself for war, or what was going on? Uh, to some extent, I mean, part of the what we all need to do in these liquid times, these times of uh, weakening, is to, uh, we're going to need to find a way to endure as men and women of faith. And that's going to re require strength, inner strength. And Newman was a great, has for me at least, been a great source of inner strength. Well, I think this is a good place to uh, end the program. Uh, that we need to gird ourselves for this liquid time to provide s s some center of steadiness. Thank you for joining A Journey Through NYC Religion. Thank you, Rusty, for joining us today. A pleasure. Okay.